to make up their minds whether they would like to join us or not. And then we can actually close the doors and people would have to sneak in with or without the politics. <laughs> And we, we start. Okay, this is the session number four, Aging and the Media. And I'm very honored and, and happy to be able to announce that we have outstanding people on our panel. So I'm really very happy that I'm honored that they can moderate this, uh, this uh, section. I will uh, present it very, very briefly because it's much more interesting to hear what they have to say than to go at length with them. You can you have these CDs which are very impressive. Uh, we start with Simon Cox, Emerging Markets Editor of The Economist based in Hong Kong. He has written numerous reports, none of them yet. <laughs> but we're looking forward to this uh, because he seems that very steep learning curve for all the topic and issues of this topic and issues the next round of uh, report. Uh, yeah, please. You can start. And the strategies, I understand, will be structured in five minutes to give an overview of how your reasoning would go and then elaborate later on among ourselves and then within uh, the, the whole uh, auditorium and the audience to elaborate. Say as well, and so we hope to make it uh, uh, very lively and interesting and interactive. Simon, thank you. Well, thanks very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so, journalism is mostly about finding good examples. Uh, and so, I'd like to share with you uh, my favorite example of what we've been talking about today. Um, so, this is uh, Nigel Farage. It will be known to many of you as the chief proponent of Brexit, uh, Britain's decision to leave the EU. This is Keanu Reeves, who will be known to many of you as the star of Matrix Speed Point Break. Believe it or not, these two men are both 54. <laughs> now, I, I don't have a better illustration of the relativity of age. I, I guess we can. We can argue over who's the most productive. Um, Keanu Reeves has basically been playing the same character for his entire career without any real notable increase uh, in productivity. Uh, Nigel Farage changed the course of British history, uh, unfortunately, for the worse. Um, in preparation for today's talk, I thought I'd look at uh, The Economist's uh, past coverage of ageing. Um, if you punch the term ageing into our historical archive, uh, you actually get uh, a big increase in hits uh, in the late 80s. That seems to be when it really became a big issue, certainly in uh, the West. Um, I checked out some of those articles. A few of them were about um, distilling Jack Daniels whiskey and then the art of uh, aging those sorts of um, uh, beverages. But there's also some good analytical work about the benefits of allowing older people to work for longer. I think the basic analysis we've had since the 80s has been fairly consistent and I would say pretty good. Uh, some of the imagery though could probably use some improvement. Um, I found this cartoon from an article in 1989. Uh, this is supposed to represent America's elder generation, a heavy burden on the working age population. I think that the view of the elderly uh, as a burden, as a fiscal challenge, has again remained pretty consistent, but our um, tone and our imagery has gone through uh, some evolution. Um, I remember there's a rather beautiful cover. Same image, essentially the same substantive image, but a much more uh, beautiful rendition of it uh, about the particular burden uh, that Japan faces. Now, I think that journalists in general face uh, some difficulty in covering this topic. It is not seen as a particularly thrilling uh, topic. Uh, we've often had to use humour to make it more engaging. Uh, I remember this cover, uh, which is a sort of visual gag, how to manage an ageing workforce, obviously meant to allude to uh, an eye test. Um, 
So this humor, you might uh, question whether the humor is in good taste or not. But I, I bring up this cover because I distinctly remember um, the editor who chose this cover being teased by one of his uh, predecessors, an earlier editor of The Economist, who said, gosh, you know, what a boring topic. It must have been a very slow newsweek. Why did you decide uh, to put the question of demographics on the cover of The Economist when normally you'd have things like presidential elections, and you might have wars, you'd have a uh, huge moment at the stage. And I think this is one of the challenges we all face as journalists interested uh, in this issue, is how to make it compelling. Now, it has one thing on its side, which is that we're all interested in spotting trends. We're all interested in futurology. And one of the great benefits of demographics is that compared with many other things, we feel confident that we can forecast it, at least we can forecast it less badly than we can forecast things like the financial markets or the fate of economies. So it has that on its side. And the reason it's forecastable is because all of these trends are slow moving. But unfortunately, the fact that it's slow moving acts against it when you're arguing the case of your article in editorial newsrooms, because the fact that it's slow moving means uh, the same story would be true next week as was true this week, and so there's no compelling reason to run the story this week uh, rather than next. Now, um, in one of the coffee breaks, I was asking uh, some of the social scientists here whether they had any pet peeves, any particular burning complaints about the way the media covered their topic. Uh, one example I was given is the confusion uh, between life expectancy at birth and life expectancy once you've reached a certain age. Um, it was mentioned uh, that, for example, in Russia, you know, the life expectancy at birth is somewhere in the uh, mid-60s, mid I think. And so many people thought that if they'd reached the age of 60, they only had four or five years to live. Of course, that's not true, but could play quite an important part uh, in uh, the debate. Um, one of my own pet peeves as an economist is the way in which um, pay-as-you-go pension schemes are often described as Ponzi schemes as a way of discrediting them. And so one of the articles of which I'm most proud um, was this one, which argued that yes, pay-as-you-go uh, pension schemes are like Ponzi schemes, but that can be a good thing. Uh, if you think about a Ponzi scheme, the definition is that early contributors are paid off with the proceeds and the contributions from later contributors. That's a problem for Ponzi schemes, because eventually you run out of new suckers to bring into your scheme. But unless there's a cataclysm that befalls us, there will always be a later generation to contribute to a pay-as-you-go pension scheme, so that's not necessarily an argument uh, against these uh, schemes. Now, um, I did want to sort of close, if I could, on a slightly more positive note. I mentioned that our coverage has gone through uh, something of an evolution. Uh, and we did um, recognize, I think, the complexity of the topic in an article written in 2014 uh, when we described the billion shades of grey. Now, first, this is pointing out the differentiation that's required in coverage of ageing. It's also an attempt to be humorous. But at least this time, the humor you know, is a little bit kinky, which I think is a sort of an advance on the slightly mocking humor of some of the covers uh, I described earlier. And with that, I'll close. Thank you so much. Um, the next speaker is, sorry, is Elizabeth Isaiah, founder and CEO of the Global Institute for Experience and Entrepreneurship. Uh, we learned that she has, uh, among many other things, uh, reinvented herself and uh, found the Global Institute of Experience Entrepreneurship uh, at biography uh, yes, yeah. at 70 and uh, has uh, consulted with the Obama administration, with the White House, US Congress, US State Department, Federal Reserve, the European Union, many international and transnational organizations. And uh, we are very interested to learn with this uh, to, uh, it's all around, you know, to run your own new business in. Okay. First, let me thank Lauren for his kind invitation and finding me on Google and bringing me here to Bangkok. And also thank you to Stephanie for organizing and actually physically getting me here. But I think a special thanks also I would like to extend the survey because I had never heard the uh, expression prospective aging before. And I love it. 
From now on, whenever I speak, I'm going to introduce myself as a 30-year-old with 46 years of prospective experience. <laughs> so thank you, sir. And I'd like to talk about, we've been talking about workforce and uh, tapping into the resource of the older generation in the workforce. And it's a huge untapped resource. But what we haven't discussed at all really is entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship never really gets old. And what is really fascinating in the world today is that several, many countries, actually, the rate of entrepreneurship is higher for the 55 year old than it is for the younger individual. In the UK, in the United States, it's 25% higher than younger people starting a business. In Australia, it's a third of the population are starting businesses. And a third of those people are over 55. As I say, they wear knights in shining armor because they've never had their medal. <laughs> older and older entrepreneurial women, and I am focusing on women, because in all of my experience around the world, it really is more older women are starting their own businesses than older men. Plus the fact that they get very little attention, so I thought I would highlight their work today. They are debunking the negative stereotypes of aging in all manner of ways. They are fueled by imagination, energy, grit, and tenacity. And they are powered by a lifetime of experience. They are today's dynamic new economic engines. This is not work to make people feel good or to be nice. This is an economic imperative that we tap into this resource. These individuals are boosting economies locally and globally. And they are too often hidden in plain sight. It's time that we all see these underappreciated powerhouses of productivity. The first one I'd like to point out, and as Simon said, I always like to show examples. This woman uh, was laid off from a technology firm in Silicon Valley. She was online looking for other work, and she saw an advertisement for a mannequin. She said, I've always wanted one of those in my garden. So she called the person and said, I'd like to buy that. He said, well, you'll have to take all 50. And she said, what am I going to do with 50 mannequins? And he said, I don't care. If you want one, you have to take all 50. So she took them. And she brought them to her garage. I mean, we think of Steve Jobs starting a business in his garage. She brought 50 mannequins in all different shapes and forms into her garage and started repurposing those mannequins. She started selling them came and the arms were off or whatever, and she started repurposing them, fixing them up again. And she now has a business across the United States with contractors all over the country where she supplies mannequins to different stores. And what she does is brilliant because big department stores have to pay people to come and take this away when they want a new, fresher mannequin. And she said, I'll volunteer to take them. So she volunteered, she takes them, she repurposes them, and lo and behold, she has this nationwide business that she started out of her garage at age 55. And she also won the Environmental Protection Agency Award for keeping 100,000 pounds of unbiodegradable material out of the land. <clears throat> this woman lives in rural Wisconsin, and her entrepreneurship effort was taking old sweaters, tearing them apart, repurposing them, and making them into very beautiful sweater creations. When I first interviewed her, she said, oh, well, I'm not an entrepreneur. I just work out in rural Wisconsin. And I said, where do you get your supplies? Who, who helps you mail these, your mailing materials? And she said, well, I never even thought about that. So she's very much boosting her local economy. Pearl is one of my favorites in her happy cane business. She got tired of her old black cane, and she started gluing some flowers on it. Her grandson came and said, where did you get that? She said, I made it. And he said, can you make some more? And she said, well, I guess I could. And so she, to make the story short, she started selling them on Etsy. And it got so busy and in such high demand, she lives in a senior housing facility. She couldn't do it all. So she reached out to her neighbors. So you talk about the social as well as the economic benefits of this. It's huge. This woman became 
an engineer at age 92, and I have to whip through some of these. But also, when you look at the slides, please note that these are all intergenerational businesses. And what we really have to do is get seniors out of that silo and understand the social fabric is intergenerational, and that's how it's going to move forward. So we have perspective and insight that allow you to see what matters most, to be more efficient with your time. And it doesn't matter if you're 25, 65, or 95. Vision and ability to execute are what separates entrepreneurial champions from all others. And this is one of my favorites, that don't wear a beige or can kill you. So when we talk about the media and picturing older people, think of the vitality and the energy of these women. And these women are just a tiny example of women all over the world who are starting everything from a micro-enterprise to macro-billion dollar enterprise. And don't underestimate this incredible resource. Governments and companies do it at their peril. In terms of investing capital, as someone said earlier, human capital investment in these businesses, businesses and venture capitalists are just beginning to see that investing in a senior entrepreneur is a good investment because the senior entrepreneur's business, 70% of those businesses are in business after five years versus 28% of younger people's businesses. So I'll stop there until I get very passionate about this. Thank you so much. So we can all take <laughs> with us a lesson for life. Don't wear beige. It will kill you. <laughs> At any age, even if you're a young person, especially if a young person, you may look uh, not so young anymore. Uh, now, the next uh, speaker is Mr. Stephen Petrov, book author, award-winning journalist, Washington Post, New York Times, USA Today. Um, so he has uh, been uh, very, very successful uh, in terms of uh, being read, and not just listened to, so we uh, have the privilege of listening to him and maybe also starting to read some of this. Thank you. Uh, I want to um, also thank Sergey for inviting me. And um, just to say, I was working on a piece last year when I was 60, and it was about my midlife crisis. And many of my friends said, sorry, Stephen, you're no longer in life, do the math. And so we thought he was not going to have a lifespan of 120. And then I talked to Sergey, who told me I was in midlife. And I was very happy, sir. So thank you. And so we thank you also for, um, for all of your help. I wanted to talk a little bit about today about Um, how, how we can work together, because when I think about bridging research and policy, I think journalists are right in the middle of that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about my world, I think our world, and, um, and show you, I hope, some of the points of intersection and um, help us understand each other. So we are having a tough time in journalism, perhaps you have heard. And uh, that is not only, not only about the individuals and, and our families, but it's really about what it means democratic societies, and specifically to um, writing about science, health, and medicine, and that is sort of where I see all of this fitting. And uh, newsroom employment has dropped by a quarter in the past 10 years, and in newspapers alone, it's been 45%. So, um, so and people often say, well, that's, that's print, you know, digital is the future. Well, a journalism review, that is not quite the future. It's um, also a dark picture for our digital journalism. Right? And uh, this is from January, when another thousand layoffs occurred. So it's a problem that's accelerating uh, and, and I think worsening. And one of the major effects is that we're losing great journalists, veteran journalists, who have worked in the science field for years, if not decades. And now we have a great group of entrepreneurial and younger journalists that really don't have the same kinds of background to understand the type of work you are doing. And I will also say, as one who has, has um, been around for a couple of years, I think you all speak a completely different language than me. And um, uh, 
uh, I've learned them actually certain things today. I think what it was that um, alpha, uh, the term alpha that we're looking at, and, um, and SDG, which you all use as though you know it's milk, and I had to go look it up, and now I know exactly what SDG is, and it's not an SDG. <laughs> We are also um, in a political environment now, and this is, this is a very U.S. perspective, I apologize for that, but that is, that is where I'm coming from, and I know that our president has an impact beyond our own borders, uh, which will, of course, will be made more secure once we have that wall. Uh, <laughs> but journalists are regularly called now the enemy of the people, and that has had a profound um, impact on my colleagues and myself. Uh, Five uh, newsroom workers were shot killed last year in Maryland. Uh, many commentators and columnists made the connection between the political environment and, and much of the president's words on what happened there. Uh, pipe bombs were sent not only to Democrats, but to CNN and other media outlets. And this, um, this story here, a reader became my stalker. Is this the new norm for journalists? Well, that was my reader, that's my story. Uh, so, Few journalists have real scientific knowledge. That kind of goes back to uh, what I was making. There are a number of resources, I and mean, there's actually so many, many bright spots to it. And I just want to point out a few of them. So the American Association of Healthcare Journalists has really in-depth resources for us on aging. This is a, a top-line uh, topic sheet. Then they go into um, resources and tip sheets on a variety of topics. So all those resources are very helpful. Uh, the National Press Foundation, Making Good Journalists Better, uh, runs fellowships and trains journalists to cover aging better. And I've part participated in these. These are some of the um, you know, some of the, the sections that we had um, reporter tips from each other, and um, also using data to report on aging information. Um, finally, I want to just leave you with a model. Another um, another fellowship that. Um, at the National Press Foundation was on mental health issues. And the Carter Center, that's Rosalind Carter, the uh, former First Lady, uh, produced a journalism resource guide for, for behavioral health. And talking about the importance of the language we use, words, which I think has an applicability to how we all work here today. And it's a very helpful guide to my colleagues. Um, also, just kind of a, an index of terms, maybe SDG would be in there. Um, among other things, but uh, I think this is the kind of tool that um, would be a great partnership between us. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Now, in the spot, um, Paola Scomegna uh, is a senior writer of the Reference Population Reference Bureau. Uh, I understand communicating demographic research helps when being aging in a non-technical language to draw the public. So this is something all of us should try to do, whether from, you know, as journalists, as translators. Uh, I looked through the reports you listed here, and one is more interesting than the other, so I decided to read all of them. Uh, and uh, I think this is a type of work uh, badly in need, so please uh, share, share with us uh, your experience with this work of translating scientific knowledge into. Okay, thank you. So what I have is some examples of our recent work as teams bridging that research policy gap where writers and communicators and demographers working together um, to, to promote um, evidence-based policy making. So when we work to make research more accessible, we are focused on non-technical language, making it <coughs> visual, using multiple formats to reach a wide audience, and we, we try to be as interactive as possible. So I'm going to show you some of um, both the formats we've used and how we package the messages. So this is our policy brief. Many of your organizations produce these sorts of things too. We produce it with the um, Centers for the 
the, economic, the demography and economics of aging at a number of U.S. <coughs> universities, and it covers a body of research in non-technical language. Um, it also requires a PDF download, and we're finding that people can't or won't take that extra step to download the PDF to, to read it. So we take that same content and produce it as an HTML article on a web page that readers can scroll through and then look at the PDF if they decide. But these get six times the page views as our PDFs. It's as if the, the download locks up the content. So we also take our policy um, reports and try to produce them as infographics if we can so that in non-technical language, a body of research is very visual, and somebody, a non-technical, a non-expert, can enter it and grasp it quickly and clearly. So this is um, an infographic on research on aspects of neighborhood that have been linked to healthy aging. And these get 20 times the page views as our PDFs. And what's not visible on this slide, because it didn't fit, is that we include all the journal articles for which this is based at the bottom. So that if somebody wants to go deeper, it's there. So we take pieces of our infographics and share them on social media. And communications research shows that social media posts that include a link and an image, whether a figure or a picture, receive much more engagement than, ju than just plain text. People are more likely to click through to the link, share it with their networks, and our experience bears this out as well. So here's a way we try to take a lot of research and make it memorable for a non-technical audience. This was a large National Academy of Sciences report, 500 pages on the um, demography of aging that was released last fall. We packaged it as eight demographic trends transforming America's older population. And with each trend, we talked about the overall trend and then talked about the outliers so that the diversity of the aging population was, was clear. So for one of the trends, more Americans are working past age 65, but there's, a, there's an increase in those um, with low levels of education who are leaving the workforce early due to disability. So we can talk about that diversity. And we took each of those trends and shared them on social media. And this is an animated GIF file, so you can see the change over time in um, counties becoming increasingly older. The other thing that we do with our figures is that we include more exact demographic title somewhere on it. There it says median age 2020. Issuing it for 50 years, it's now a, um, an interactive website, worldpopulationdata.org. And the most recent one um, focuses on changing age structures. And users can scroll through and go deeper and deeper into the topic. And there are a lot of multimedia video choices and one thing that might be interesting to you is that we're finding that the vast majority of people who stop and watch a video on our website are under age 35, mainly ages 18 to 24. Um, so that says something about who prefers what. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> thank you so much. Um, I think in the first round we may uh, start commenting on each other to get some debates on the on the panel and then include start to include the, the audience. So is there any spontaneous reaction to whoever to each other? I have a spontaneous reaction. Please. To um to Simon and to Colin. Uh, actually, it seemed to me that we had a live on this panel with Elizabeth and I. Um, what's 
some of the important things in individuals in storytelling. And um, my other colleagues have been talking more about the data and trends. And um, it's certainly been my observation uh, during the discussion today about the importance of data to this group, which I completely understand. Um, you know, my own sense on that is that facts and data, um, fake news, fake data, alternative truth, uh, hold much less power these days in convincing our readers about anything. And every, every piece of data is suspect. And um, so I have moved from using um, more data to more storytelling. I would comment on that in that I, I started out just really focusing on storytelling and if I <coughs> shared these stories of people with governments and corporations, they would instantly see the value and very quickly realize that they don't instantly see the value until I can come up with the data that makes the economic argument for making these policy changes and changes within corporations. So to your point, I think it has to be an incredible blend of data and storytelling. You cannot have one without the other. If you just spew out data, then people get bored of years and don't off. But if you can tell the story wrapped in that data, then you get people's attention. And as much as I hate to admit it, being sort of a social person at heart, that if you cannot prove what's in it for me, for a government or a corporation, they're not going to listen. Because they have to understand. So it has to be a win-win. Come in at this. So any piece of any piece of data suspect? Question mark versus storytelling. You're a great storyteller. So how do you, how do you manage to? Integrate this. I think I'm unusual amongst uh, journalists in um, starting with the statistics and then looking for a story that illustrates the statistics. Uh, I think um, journalism privileges storytelling. There are many reporters who will only trust something they've seen with their own eyes, only trust something they've been told by you know their taxi driver. Uh, I think that's uh, awfully dangerous. I mean, I'm enough of a social scientist. I think that's horribly misleading. And a story I covered for a long while was China's economy. And it was remarkable to me that an economy that even then was over $10 trillion, people thought they could understand that economy through anecdote in a way they would never dream of doing with the US economy. They thought if they visited one ghost town, that told them everything they needed to know. A remarkably misleading. Some of the joys of growing old. 
um, including uh, the immortal quote from William James, you know, how pleasant is the day when we give up striving to be young and slender. <laughs> so, please hold on. Thank you very much. First, I wanted to say I'm really happy that this panel is, exists, and it's, it's rarely in such expert meetings that we have a panel on outreach with journalists, and it's really important and illuminating at the same time. Um, you had this discussion about whether the data are more important than the, 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 the pictures and the graphs, but I, from my perspective as a scientist, of course, the most important is to get the message right. And of course, in order to get the right message, uh, at least the journalists need to view the different arguments, look at some of the, the evidence. So it doesn't matter whether you're presented in the article or not, but you need to convey the right message. And that, since I am a regular reader of The Economist, and you mentioned being an expert on China, I'm really sort of uh, quite disappointed, mostly when, uh, uh, until recently, I should say, in The Economist, always when they were, the future of China was in the first sentence, well, the future is darkened because of population aging. And India actually has a much brighter future because it has a younger population. This is based on no scientific evidence. It's based on these very simplistic ideas of uh, fixed age dependency ratios that we've heard today. I mean, if you look at the, for instance, the human capital, which economists really have shown to be a key driver of uh, economic growth, and China is doing so much better on human capital. India, until recently, has really left half of its population back in illiteracy and now just trying to catch up. But it's about 30 years behind China. And uh, sort of, uh, as I'm saying, these are some of the real big stories. These are not just specific stories. It's a question whether China is going to be the number one economy in the world, the dominating power. And then just people claim again and again that it's population aging that will somehow stop China. What do you make of this? Yeah, actually, I mean, it's one of my complaints as well, interestingly enough. Um, you know, actually, China's population structure is incredibly complex. I mean, for one thing, you know, there was a cohort uh, around 1959 to 1961, during you know, the Great Famine, it's a very small cohort. Uh, when those people leave um, the workforce, that's actually a very small group moving into retirement. So you get a sort of reprieve almost. Um, China's population structure is, is not single peaked. Um, I also agree with you that um, you know, demographics is not destiny, and it's possible that we overdosed on that. Um, I think there was. I, I alluded to it in my opening remarks. You know, there's a sort of almost an overemphasis on demographic trends because we think we can predict them. And it gives them almost more um, sort of cognitive space in our minds than they perhaps deserve. And other things that are a little bit harder to track, very difficult to track the um, evolution of the quality of Chinese education, for example. Uh, those things that are harder to track um, perhaps get less uh, attention than they should. If you allow me to just follow up this very last point, it's harder to track. Could it be that one of the confusions which uh, constantly is in the public arena, this related to this old age dependency ratio, today there are three active people financing one retiree, but in the future it can be two to one instead of three to one and so on. All of this mixing up the population of working age with the working population. These are totally different things. So it's the systems dependency ratio, not the old age. Adapts static versus adapts fake in Germany. It's a totally different world, but it's as if it would be the same. And we have constant debate. And what we see is that this era, so to speak, circulates so rapidly that once they are in the repolitical, the public the arena debate, you cannot ever, because people are kind of in a copycat world, copying from each other and repeating the same errors, stupidities, I'm sorry. They have read somewhere in a in a medium which has the reputation like the Spiegel Archive or the Economist the Intelligence Unit. But they are so good on, on checking the, the facts and figures and the data that they cannot err except they, they cannot err except they occasionally do. And I think this is this may be one of the problems in the you know how to how to undo circulating falsified information. Okay, 
Um, so again, I, I agree with you, um, and uh, sometimes I'll go through or copy correcting that. Um, I'll say a couple of things. One is that um, our confidence in the sort of labor force surveys in China is less than it would be for an OECD country. Nonetheless, you can look at the National Bureau of Statistics and they point, they uh, put out every year um, uh, a labor force estimate of the number of people uh, actively participating in the economy. And I believe it's still going up. I believe it's still going up. It was the last time I checked. Um, can I say something that will sound remarkably trivial to you, but I think matters. Working age population is a long and ungainly phrase. Workforce is simple. We don't even put a hyphen in there. And you'd be amazed at what difference that makes in editor's minds. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Shabashar from uh, Economic Commission for Africa, based in Addis Ababa. I have a question for Elizabeth on entrepreneurship. Um, in Africa, the majority are self-employed. Not sure if you can call them entrepreneurs, but overall you have people who are motivated by necessity. They have no other choices, and then you have people, uh, entrepreneurs who are motivated by opportunity. And we can actually uh, there's data on, uh, on, on from many African countries. What we find uh, quite often is that knowing someone else who started business in the past couple of years uh, is a good predictor of you becoming a opportunity driven entrepreneur. And I'm wondering, based on the stories that you shared with us, uh, to what extent, uh, coming from Africa, my interest is more on the youth college, but uh, it's important to bridge out the youth with the older. I'm wondering if, uh, uh, based on the stories, is there any uh, you know, uh, mentorship or uh, some sort of connection between uh, those who uh, started their businesses later and those who are starting to uh, uh, study at earlier ages, uh, just to... Uh, Absolutely, thank you for that question. That, that we really focus on that catalyzing the experience across generations. And there's some wonderful examples in Africa of older African women who have these little family subsistence farms and they can take care of their families, but it's really isolated to, to the individual family's economy. And young African women who are being introduced to technology. There's fabulous programs about coding in Africa and getting online. And so the younger people reach out to the older women farmers and said, we, would you be able to create enough product that we can bring it to the market through the digital technology? So it's an incredible partnership. The other really fascinating one in Africa that I love is between older women and younger women. Again, it's a technology-related product in that it's, it's um, the, um, the solar panels. And the younger women have created this marketing program to solar panel, for solar panels, but did not have, know how to get it out to the villages. So they went to the older women and said, can you help us get these in the villages and educate the people? Everything, entrepreneurship has to be grassroots stuff. We cannot layer it over and say, this is what we do, and this is terrific. So they went to the older women, and the women came forth with their donkeys. And they, there's fabulous pictures of these women, older women and their donkeys, who have, like, instead of saddlebags, they have solar panels on the side. And the younger women come, and teach the villagers how to use these. It's absolutely brilliant and so powerful. And, and it, again, it's so far-reaching. We talk about individual aging. We talk about individual economics. But this is society aging. This is environmental protection and building on natural environment. So it's so expensive to just try to limit it to entrepreneurship. And I keep saying, it's not just entrepreneurship and starting a business. It's entrepreneurship and how do we think entrepreneurially about an aging society and how to optimize it for people of all ages. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. We, we just learned that visualization does not only mean visualizing mass data, but actually images may be more sticky to your mind. So it's all depends on the fact that we, you, you don't forget it. No. 
once you, once you have seen the herd. So I think it's very important that different modes of visualization have different kind of stickiness in terms of success. Uh, the director of the Malaysian Research Institute on Aging, uh, Ms. Amitis, yeah. next. I would like to ask, so, like for us as researcher, we produce our data and then we are also uh, trying to do advocacy for the information that we want to do. So do you think that it should be us doing it or we work with other partners so that we, so that whatever message that we want to come out, then it will be a better, per, uh, in a better perspective. Because I, we have this dilemma of, we just want to produce data, but we know that we have to do advocacy for the data so that the policy makers will take it out. So do you think that we should do ourselves or we should work with collaborators so that the messages that, that we come out from our data would be more uh, receptive by other people? So this obviously is a question to, to all of you. I'll start. So in, in my experience, many journalists have trouble interpreting data and need help from you all. So um, I think that you need to produce the data and then you need to interpret it and also help translate it into the type of policies that you would advocate for. But I would also say you know, the gentleman over there made a point earlier about the right message. I think if I were to go and talk to five of you or ten of you and say, what was the right message or the one message that came out of this meeting, I would hear different messages. And um, so the more that you also can cooperate and, and um, collude, um, you help to um, simplify the message in a, in a way for, for us. And I think you'll have a better chance of getting that across for all kinds of reasons. Some of them, some of them not. But this disillusioning uh, truth. Any, 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 any. Okay. So let me continue with the, the very lively audience, please. Yeah. Uh, well, my, 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 my comment has to do that in this case when we're talking about demographic data, which has the advantage of being more certain than other kind of data, such as the economic scenarios. Demographic scenarios are usually more precise than economic <coughs> or political scenarios. And uh, I share the frustration that Walter mentioned earlier when you try to communicate these very precise, for example, scenarios regarding aging, and then you don't have, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, you don't have echo in other sectors or in terms of how we are communicating. So it's very frustrating. But um, I, 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 th I think it's very interesting that you said that data is less powerful today. Terms, you said data is less powerful today. So um, it's what we do, and we have to continue doing it because it's how we do it. But I do think that we need to change the way we, the scientists, communicate demographic research. You know? So in a way, um, the question is, so you have this tendency where data is less powerful when you have more sources of information which are not uh, strong data. And uh, to what extent do you Feel that um, the, 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 meets, the, the media has this openness to move still towards the scientific community when you have all these other sources of, of data that are more attractive. No? And the other thing is about in the, in the table, you have two different uh, audiences. No? One would be uh, policymakers, for example, in the case of the PME, and the other would be what we call education in population, no? target to a larger audience. And there you will have also generational differences. My students, for example, they don't read the newspaper. They read like this kind of uh, journalism that is done within um, specific websites. I don't know how to call it. Blogs, perhaps, which we so would say blogs, not but journalism. Not, yeah, they read a lot of blogs, and that's why they get more. And they, they, they put their own information, the information they are generation, generated in the blogs, which is very attractive to them. And then finally, well, the other thing is, uh, in my own experience with the media, the problem is that uh, journalists always want me to make it um, attractive. For example, you're talking about migration. They don't want to know that migration falls to the US are decreasing. No? They want to know like the, the, the bad part. So how do you build 
a positive narrative on aging, quite, quite this attractive is uh, pointing out like, the bad parts. Okay, you must think uh, it's attractive by the bad news, please. Well, I've always learned um, never to say always and never, uh, because journalism and journalists are a, you know, a very large and, and diverse group, um, and often confused these days by, by the public as to what is a journalist, what is a journalist do versus many of these other voices out there. Um, I, I would agree with you that there is often a focus on, um, on the negative, because part of, I think, the way I see what we do is to improve, and so reporting on good news is not so much news. But I mean, from what I've heard here today so far, there is there's actually much great news in, in terms of the, the definitions that you're using, the data that you are presenting, the passion with which you are presenting that. I, the message, one of the big messages I'm taking away is the passion, the engagement from so many of you in what you were talking about. That has really um, stayed with me. I'll just add to that, too, in terms of the overwhelming negative data about aging. And it is overwhelming, and it's so easy to perpetuate that negative message. So I'm constantly looking to research to find out what, what's the data point that is going to get people's attention that this could be a positive. And, and I was doing an OECD program in Spain. And a woman came up to me and she presented me with some research that they'd done recently in Barcelona. And she said, did you realize that according to this research, which I've studied and it's, it's, it's incredible, she said, the government has found out that for every euro, they invest in what they call mitigating the retirement syndrome. For every euro Spain invests, they get 129 euro return on that investment and was like, whoa. You no, know, of course I didn't I thought that's so not I didn't believe her because it was such an incredible statistic. But that's where we go back to the data. And she showed me the data so that I could go with to audiences around the world and as they're talking about, well isn't this nice for old people? And that's why I can say it's not just nice. Look at the economics of this. And so it's it's you have to find that little nugget of information that is going to shut down the overwhelming amount of negativity. And it gets very hard at times, very challenging if you think, I can never, ever get on top of this. People call it the silver tsunami. I said it is not a silver tsunami, it's a silver lining. And if we optimize it, it will yield golden dividends. And so it's like, you have to be able to turn it around like that. But it's hard. I, I, I think when obviously this is a divide between those who read the, the positive or the negative side. You know, if I told you 60 is the new 51 and I can prove it this day, would you be more happy? I guess it would. It's really, really new, new 51, so this is a... <laughs> uh, so, but uh, it's Carol Jagger, you know, this is not the, the epidemiology has a lot to say to this, so please come in uh, if we have postponed your intervention. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I just want to pick up on the positive and the negative um, a little bit um, and also say um, to Simon and to Stephen uh, a question really uh, about this uh, negative view that the, the press uh, tend to take um, in my experience. So um, I last year had two very high profile papers on a, a project uh, which were projections, health projections. Um, and the first one that happened, they had a lot of media attention. Um, the, the one in Jan that came out in January only had a negative message. And I'm, I'm not apologizing for that. It's, you know, it, we need to know what we're facing in and this was in terms of multiple diseases. Um, so that was the, the only message that could come out. But, but the one later on in the year, which I'll present a bit of tomorrow, um, did have some positive um, news in there. Um, and it was really difficult to get that out. And I'm not talking about um, you know, the broadsheets like the, the Mail and the Mirror. 
I'm, I'm talking about the Times, I'm talking about John Humphreys on Today. I was desperately trying to get this nugget of good news in and couldn't because all they wanted to hear was the bad news about high dependency increasing. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I'm, I know bad news sells, but it's really, it is quite hard to get that over. And, and then the second thing was, I think it, it behoves us to be better trained and to train our juniors well to be able to communicate with you. And in, in Newcastle, um, we're not allowed to talk to the media unless we've had media training, so I had to do all of this media stuff because my junior wasn't, wasn't trained. Um, and we have to write press releases, and it's only through doing that in conjunction with our press office that you learn how to put your message over more simply than in an academic paper. But perhaps for me, the most important experience I've had was that I was a maths teacher in school in a previous life. And so, you know, teaching maths to third year boys, you know, you have to have a very clear message. <laughs> Yeah, the, the nugget of good news was that the biggest increase was in levels of low dependency, which are eminently reversible. What's the meaning of that? <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll, ex I'll explain that tomorrow. <laughs> but my immediate reaction was, I don't understand what the meaning of that is no, in no. a broader sense. No, sure. But, but, but why, why should you understand um, that less than you would about increases in high dependency? Yeah. <laughs> right. Maybe um, let me make a couple of points if I could. Um, I'm not completely sure I, I get your point, but it sounds like um, what you're talking about is uh, you know, elderly people who um, would need a certain amount of support. But, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And, and so the, um, the big increase in the elderly population is not those people need a lot of support, it's people who need to provide little support, and it therefore be easily redressed. Um, I think you know, possibly one difficulty in selling that story is that um, uh, there are two directions to it. Uh, dependency is going up, but it's not the bad kind, it's the good kind. So it's an, amel an amelioration of a negative thing. Um, and so you, you're asking for a sort of, it's a slight sort of zigzag in uh, the way you pitch it. Um, I think that in general, I think this applies to a couple of third points that were made. Um, sometimes if you're talking to a journalist, you might be able to figure out what stage of the journalistic production process you're at. Now it may be that the journalist has already pitched the story, they've already got an angle, they think they know something, and all they want you to do is very conveniently provide them the statistic that would illustrate what they think they already know. Very difficult to talk a journalist out of that if they're at that late stage of the game. Probably your best hope is um, to frustrate them a little bit, but also to sort of encourage them to pitch another story in the future that might be a little bit more open-minded. Now what's working in your favor is that if enough journalists think they know this thing, then countering it becomes contrarian. And more than positive or negative, contrarian is what we're after, right? So, um, that, that would then um, help you in a future interaction. Um, I remember someone saying something on a panel like this that I thought was very wise. They said, in your first conversation with a good journalist, you'll be shocked at how stupid they are. <laughs> shocked. But if they're a good journalist, on your second conversation with them, you'll be surprised at how much they've learned in the meantime. You know, because that stupid journalist is probably having to, you know, they're probably in a later stage of their other article where they're having to learn about something completely different. You know, and, and so uh, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt um, on that. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say. That reminds me of the importance of cultivating your association with journalists so that we have a relationship. You can explain to me well, why are you interested in high tennis and not low tennis and help, help me understand that because when we trust, we will go back to you time and time. Yeah, I should say that, that, that my interactions have been very positive generally and people have come back to me and asked me things specific to them. Yeah. Um, um, coming back to 
Carol's point, where the bad news actually said, I'm not, I'm not so sure. Because if it's always the same story, it's always the same quote unquote news, they are not news any longer. And so, as Simon was pointing out, it seems, you know, some, it becomes so boring. And so, so that's some surprising news, even if they're good news, may actually be more welcome. Because you have heard the very same story negative so many times. So you can't, you know, the, the, the number of dependent people will be in absolute numbers, but the share will be much less. Or the fact that the, 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 the share of those 80 plus among those above 65 will quadruple within a generation may mean that you have higher absolute numbers of people with disabilities in full dependency, but so much less than you would probably expect. And this is a great good news. But the question is, how do you frame it? And how you know what, what packaging you do to the same kind of uh, facts? And I think we have to learn a lot as social scientists to how to cater towards the need of people who may have, you know, very short time to hammer out so many thousand signs, including, you know, and we are not to, because we have all the time in the world, and if it doesn't come out this month, the new book, so it comes out next month, and people long songs compare. This is not the case for if you, if you have an article in the Washington Post or in, in the Indie Comics, I imagine, I know actually. So having written thousands, I mean, you know, op-eds and articles, and this is a different, this, this is a different métier, and this has its own laws, and we have to respect them if we want to get messages across. And I think we, we are not very good at this, honestly. So yes, we have to learn also. We always ask others to have steep learning curves, but we are not very steep ones ourselves. That, that's my experience. And so talking not to each other, but to people whom we have to convince that this is worth getting attention, may need some discipline on our side as well, I guess. Please. Uh, uh, my side. Oh, reaching? Uh, thanks. Uh, so many questions. Let me try to take just one. Uh, it's really nice conversations. Uh, I, wish, I, I wish that there were more stories investigating disruptive innovations that not simply empower individuals, but actually come through on what sorts of policies or interventions um, could be kind of put in place. Because I still feel that most of the stories that we're reading um, are either how an individual can improve their lifestyle or highlighting a really interesting person who's had a possibility to make a change. But from a, from a game changing I feel that there's not enough that's looking at not just technological change, but social innovation as well. Because not just what I mentioned earlier, how are we going to release ourselves from sort of the systems from the last century to really prepare for what our colleague from Japan mentioned as well, that you know people are going to be living to 100, more and more. I mean, the, the, this is happening. And to what extent are we really going to change our, our uh, the way we're currently set up? I mean, now we have uh, everyone is running for uh, electric cars. Uh, kids are now missing school and demonstrating. Maybe we're reaching a tipping point, maybe, in one area. But what's going to be the tipping point that's going to make people realize in different countries and different areas? And those are the sorts of stories I'm hoping to hear. Um, because on one hand, people need better understanding, and on the other hand, we want to promote action. Thanks. Thank you, Ritu. I have also uh, Professor Shearing Hussein, who also claimed that simultaneously. So please. Well, thank you very much for a very engaging discussion. I've been listening. Um, I have to say I'm very frustrated with the media when it comes to aging. So I've looked at different, um, there are a number of studies actually to look at the portrayal of older people in the media, different forms of media. And it's usually very negative. 
Um, then when you add to that migrant older people, ethnic groups, whatever, that creates a lot of tension and a lot of negativity that can be taken back to the community. So communities of people, older groups, they do feel isolated. So I've done a couple of uh, research projects in the UK. And it's this kind of impact of the negative media. So it's, it's the right to, to um, you know, sword with the two sharp points. Um, and I think there is, there is a need to, um, you know, I'll throw the tipping point. But I think we're far away from that. There is even um, the examples that Simon goes, usually kind of negative imagery. Um, it doesn't sell very much. It's a very difficult topic to talk about. It's always portrayed in a negative way. And it does sell. And it's exactly like migration. You know, most of the news speak up in a negative way even if you do research and you show negatives and positives. And when these things com combine, it can create problems. Uh, so where is the position of the media? No, you're not representing media. But I mean, you can give some insight because it's, it's a real issue. Thank you. If I may, the point I wanted to make was exactly related to these last two points. Could I just add on to that? Okay. So Exceptionally. Very very see what people pass the voice next. Okay, please. But, but very briefly, the, the thing that we haven't talked about, and, and actually in this case the media I think is just um, indicative of the wider society as a whole, which is that our uh, perceptions, our understanding of the reporting media, of the media itself, is related to our ingrown or, or, or deep-seated perceptions of older people, which is uh, being captured in part of the work that the WHO is doing around ageism. We are, uh, even in the conversations and the discussions, the jokes, the asides that we make here in this room about our perceptions of being old, we laugh you know, quite happily about ourselves and quite happily construe old as negative, even here in this room. Yet if you were to swap old with any other characteristic in society, any other descriptor, we would be shocked to hear ourselves doing that. So that's the challenge that we have, is how do we shift that and what is the role actually in media and the journalists and, you know, of, of making that happen as well. I'd like to jump in there in terms of, um, it's, as Rita said, talking about the individual stories about public policy changes. All of our work and all of my work in my organization is building the body of stories to promote policy change. And we can only do it by, to your point also, is stop making jokes about it and treating it, you know, as if it's some object of humor and turning that around and emphasizing the positive of it. We have a project right now that we're working on in England uh, with the local industry strategy groups where they have suddenly realized their workforce development, they're building sustainable economies in rural communities as well as cities like Manchester. They have to factor in the economic power of the older demographic. And so we have only gotten to that point in the UK by telling these stories, presenting the data that you all come up with, and showing that this is an economic positive for community. So it's, while we are focused on individual stories here, and I was showing individual stories, it's really the cumulative effect of those stories worldwide that's changing, and I have seen policy changes around the world. Even in Japan, as someone mentioned earlier, where it's the strictest form of society in terms of positive aging, one of the most innovative centers in the world is in Iota, Japan. Oita, I can never pronounce it correctly, which is an intergenerational incubator for starting businesses. And it's a fabulous program. But we never would have gotten there if the State Department hadn't asked me to get over there and tell people what this older demographic, what the value of it is. So it's just, it's, though we seem to be focused on individual stories, and I admit we have to stop the laughing, that is horrendous, but it's, it's building the cumulative effect of the individual stories which are grounded in reality. This just can't be something that some figment of Elizabeth's imagination wouldn't just be 
a wonderful work, I have to present stories of real people from real communities. Again, it's not me going to Japan or to Africa or to Australia. It's finding people in those countries that prove the validity of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, 
if you make the data easy to download and comparable across countries. <laughs> So it's convenience. You see, people want to be spoiled. This is fair enough. So, who, Warren's, what's that? Okay, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Andrew Scott from London Business School. Uh, this is a big issue, and I'm sort of trying to work out what to say that's simple and understandable. I kind of feel the need to say something historical. But Stuart just said, can we replace it with something a bit more nuanced? I just want to make a historical point that for most of human history, people have never known how old they are. They didn't know the day they were born, they didn't know the year they were born. And starting about 150 years ago, governments started keeping accurate birth records. In the 1930s, we invented the song Happy Birthday, we now celebrate birthday parties, and we shifted to a chronological sense of age. For most of human history, we haven't had this obsession about different generations either, because we've become quite so segregated. So this is a pretty profound problem that we've got. And I think there's kind of a lot of different nuances in this debate. One is we're trying to get rid of out-of-date stereotypes, which is obviously important. I think we've got to be careful that we don't replace it with new stereotypes. And I think, you know, to me, the two things, and I'll talk about this tomorrow when I have my session that's happening, is one is we're aging differently from past generations, and that's good news. But just as we're aging differently from past generations, not everyone today is aging in the same way. There's just lots of heterogeneity. And I think kind of what we've got to try and do is to stop this dynamic about young or old, millennials and baby boomers, as if these are simple characteristics. We're just human. Now, of course, the danger with any form of mass media is that we use shortcuts to try and communicate a story. And so something that 53-year-old you know, Andrew Scott said something, is by providing some information. But it's probably just not a lot of information. And I think until we can move away from that chronological sense of age, which we've adopted the last 150 years, we have a problem. The good news is there's so many people that in the later years that perhaps that heterogeneity of old age will become more and more apparent and we'll start dropping these sort of rather useless nominal numbers. <coughs> Mr. Chair, if I may, um, I thought that with all these discussions, I, I think it's a, it's really a question of values and principles. You see, we uh, traditionally we uh, uh, societies have uh, have their own values and, uh, and principles that are quite similar across cultures and religion. But now we have a very modern culture uh, that uh, tends to inhale a lot of the negativities that we now uh, have come to sort of accept and laugh about as well. So I thought that the solution with this sort of forum moving forward when we're trying to preach research and policy is why don't we agree on training, retraining on values and zoom it down to, to reporting and approaches and uh, identifying mechanisms uh, so that we can be seen to be effectively addressing the issues. I thought that this is a good forum to put it down as outcomes. Because when we go back to our different nations, it's really about, okay, after all the technicalities, what is really for us to implement? Because in five or four years' time, we come back here. And we might, if we're not measuring, we're simply not moving anywhere. Okay. I, 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 I want to you brought up because sorry. I think uh, the, the whole question Again, this is the great paradox of so artificial intelligence is driving us to a new sense of education and ethics. And Harvard has just started a new program about the ethics of artificial intelligence for undergraduates. So we are teaching ethics again in a way that we haven't in a long, long time because we have the danger of artificial intelligence perpetuating these myths through the algorithm. And so it's a, it's a kind of coming in through the back door, I think, as you mentioned earlier. But it is happening, and it, the technology is actually driving this back to the ethics of, of artificial intelligence and, and how to keep it ethical and unbiased. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. My apologies for if you don't know the names of all people who raising their hands, it's difficult. 
not to make mistakes in the sequencing and the time order. Where people raise against, on my list is Warren Wolfgang and Caroline. If this is the case, please make very short statements because we want to get the very last round of, uh, on, on the panel to respond to your queries, so please be short and concise. I was just going to say that uh, Sergey and I first published our new data in, on aging in population uh, reference bureau 2008. We have a world population uh, world aging data sheet with data for all countries of the world. Our part of one of our new measures is on the UN website. All you have to do is click on it. It couldn't be easier to get. Still, we can't get any journalists to look at it. Please, other good news. Uh, thank you. Just yeah, we have also the new Wittgenstein Center Data Explorer with it, all the new measures as well as for every country in the world, not only the age and sex structures, but also the educational attainment distributions for every country for the rest of the century, and reconstructed now back to 1950. But this was all my purpose. I wanted to come back to the uh, beginning, uh, where we talked about uh, what is the, the message to be conveyed. And we now heard a lot about uh, values and the different ways of interpreting the data. But I think we should not forget, in science, we typically are not satisfied with just having one opinion opposed to another opinion. But the main of scientists, we then start hypothesis testing. We are thinking on what basis we look, have a closer look at the data and have some scientific dispute, peer review, and so on. So I think that is an essential difference between how science works and how the, the media and the political life work. I just wonder, maybe you want in your concluding comment, say a word how you, you deal with this. It's not just one scientist having this opinion and another, another one. We can go further, we can test which one is the better, which one is the more appropriate according to specified criteria. Okay, so moving on the search for the ultimate truth, please come in. Uh, Finally. And I think it, it connects to what, what was just said. What we have so far we have spoken about those, the media who produce and the, the, uh, the science community, the community that provides the information. We have not spoken about the recipients. And I think we, we really have to also think, and that leads me back to, to the question, what, are the break, what is the breaking news and the challenge? And I think we also have to understand who is our audience and speak the language of the audience, target the audience, and the, the audience of the economist is very different from the audience of the PRB, and it's very different from the written media, radio, TV, so I think that is very important and it's a little bit a pity that we did not have time to also look at, at, at this, to look in this uh, discussion um, at, uh, at, at media and the presentation from that angle. But maybe in your last words you can say, share a few thoughts. Thank you. Okay, famous last words. Do all of us want to have last words with some of you? Uh, not please uh, enjoy your last words. Understand. I don't try to do a very fascinating discussion though, and uh, I'll certainly download your data. I think uh, one of the most important takeaways for me with this audience is your inquiring minds, and we must never lose that. Because once we stop questioning, we won't come up with the answers. And the questioning, the inquiry is all about playing with ideas. And I, one of my favorite quotes is from George Bernard Shaw, who of course is a playwright, but also one of the co-founders of the London School of Economics. And his quote is, we don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. So we must not stop playing with ideas. You've got to keep challenging us and telling us, for Pete's sake, get the story right. So do not let up on media in any form. I'm going to be a little contrarian. And um, <laughs> you know, I can say that your belief in science and data is not entirely shared by me. Because I think it presumes that all data 
equal. And when I have found that the ability to drill down, that is not true. So um, good, solid, peer-reviewed data is crucial in me believing the work that you do. So the generosity uh, of uh, one person on the panel helps us to close the session with one minute delay, I apologize. <laughs>